okay so let's start with a super quick revision of uh, miscellaneous provisions chapter uh, now we are going to take up selective sections from this particular chapter because as the name suggests it is anyway miscellaneous yes so let's start with a few sections here section number 144 which talks about presumption as to documents now whatever documents have been produced by any person under this law or whatever documents have been seized from anyone's custody or whatever documents have been received from outside India let's say those documents relate to me okay and it has been produced by my opposite party in the court of law Okay, it has been produced by the prosecution or it has been pr uh, produced by any other person in the court of law. Then in such a case, it will be deemed that, it will be presumed that these documents belong to me. Okay, if it has my signature, if it has my handwriting or if it has any of my details, then it is presumed that those documents belong to me unless it is proved by, uh, unless it is proved to the contrary. Okay, if you prove it otherwise, then okay, otherwise it it is assumed that those documents etc belong to you and those documents can be used as evidence against you also yes okay then going on to the next one that is section number 145 which talks about using documents and deemed documents as evidence okay we already know that documents can be used documents are something which are printed or uh, which are uh, you know handwritten record kind of a thing uh, th those can be used as the evidence under the GST law we are specifically talking about GST law okay along with these documents there can be something called as deemed documents means which are assumed to be as documents just like any fax copy or any microfilms okay or any soft copy of the information or any computer printout even these even these will be considered as deemed documents and what is the relevance of considering these as deemed documents these can also be used as evidence in the court of law and this can be used as evidence under the gst law also then going on to the next one that is section number 146 that is common portal now uh, we already know that we already have a common portal so central government has the power to notify gst common portal on the recommendation of gst council which will be used for various various functions like taking registration for filing of returns for payment of taxes and such other matters and uh, for the e bill we have already got a different portal that is your e bill gst.gov.in and for your invoice registration etc we had seen that remember 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 for that already a different in, uh, website is present right then after that going to the next one that is section number 149 149 talks about gst compliance rating okay now this procedure is not made fully functional yet now but they are planning what they are planning is every registered person on the basis of the record of compliances okay on the basis of record of compliances it will be assigned a rating okay let's say out one on the scale of one of ten one out of ten it will be given a rating that whether this person is a proper GST compliant person or not and since uh, this is to be monitored from time to time basis so this rating is not going to be a permanent rating it will keep on revising from time to time and can we say the other people who are going to deal with us in the business those people can take help of this GST compliance rating and then they can decide whether to do business with us or not right then after that going to the next one that is your section number 158 okay as i have already told you we are just taking the selective sections here section number 158 talks about disclosure of information by a public servant now all the officers who are exercising their functions under gst those persons are considered as public servant so by default it is said that by default uh, can we say those people get to see information about us that we furnish in uh, while filing returns the information that we give during any gst proceedings any information that we submit during any court proceedings etc can we say those information are available with the public servant so can they make those information public or that has to be kept confidential so the answer is yes those have to be kept confidential but in some exceptional cases okay in some exceptional cases these information can be disclosed example if they want to by using this information or by showing this information some prosecution will be done against that person or uh, it has to be used under some other law for the timing in force or this information is required by the court of law or this information is required for doing recovery of taxes or for uh, uh, you know realization of any taxes or for levy of any taxes for collection of any taxes or for uh, 
uh, if it is required to be disclosed in public interest for such exceptional cases for such exceptional cases the information can be disclosed by the public servant okay now going on to the next section next section is important that is section number 158a along with amended new rule that is rule number 163 okay now what does this section 158a says that now let's say if i am a taxpayer okay if i am a taxpayer here and if i want to share let's say i am having some business deal with some other person let's say uh, let's talk about amalgamation merger or any other big business transaction i am going to enter with some other entity okay and that other entity is not yet sure whether i am a gst compliant person or not so it asks me can you share your gst information with me I said uh, I cannot share the uh, GST login ID and password with you because we have not yet entered into the transaction or we have not yet done the merger amalgamation. So as of now I cannot share this information with you. So in that case, so in that case GST portal gives you an option that you can share your information. Okay, you can give your information, you can give your consent to the GST portal and then if you are okay with sharing your GST information, not your credentials, okay, GST information with some other person, then by giving the consent to the GST portal, you can share your information with some other entity, okay, or with some other person. Now, what all information can be shared? Your uh, GSTR 1 information can be shared, GSTR 3B information can be shared, GSTR 2B information can be shared. Then your information that you had given at the time of registration that can be shared and uh, your, you know uh, the information that you would have furnished while preparing your e-way bill, information that you would have furnished while preparing your e-invoice etc. All those information if you give your consent to the GST portal, GST portal can share this information with any other person. Are you clear with this? Okay, but, but, but the most important thing here is before giving your consent, you have to take consent from your recipient and from your suppliers. Okay, let's say I am A limited. Okay, let's say I am A limited. Then to the recipients, okay, to whom I am making a supply, can we say his information is also going to get shared because of my re returns, okay, and the persons who have supplied me, that is my suppliers, I, I will have to, because I am sharing this information with someone else, so I will have to take the consent from my suppliers and from my recipients before I give the permission to my uh, GST portal okay once I give the permission to my GST portal then GST portal is going to share this information okay now I will tell to the GST portal share it for so and so tax period okay I will I will say that share only GSTR1 details or I will say that share all the information about me so I will give consent for respective things which is required to be shared I will give my consent to the GST portal that please share it with some other entity XYZ entity for example then GST portal will share it share this information with an NBFC which is designated as account aggregator okay it is given here in rule number 163 that this information will be shared with account aggregator now ma'am what is this account aggregator account aggregator is nothing but a NBFC which is functioning as per the guidelines of RBI and this is providing the service of sharing the information between two entities okay so basically I am giving my consent to the GST portal okay on the GST portal I will say I agree okay I will give my consent then GST portal will share this information with this NBFC that is nothing but the account aggregator and then this account aggregator will finally share this information with the other entity with whom ultimately I wanted to share my information okay so that's why that's why this is called as what that's why this is called as consent based sharing GST common portal cannot sue over to share my information with someone else huh? only if I give my consent to the GST common portal after taking consent from my recipients and my supplier only then we can share this information with the third party are you clear with this yes Okay, then going on to the next one, again next section is also important that is section number 159 which talks about publication of information, making your information public, okay, uh, information about whom, information about some persons, information about some persons in some cases can be made public. Now listen, let's say there is some proceedings going on against you or there are some prosecutions, uh, offenses relating prosecutions going on against you and if the commissioner or any authorized officer is of the opinion that your name 
let's make you famous your name should be made public okay your name should be made public or your information should be made public okay then in such cases commissioner or any other officer authorized by the commissioner if they if they are of the opinion that we should make this public this should be given in the public domain this is in public interest that we should release the name of such persons against whom proceedings or prosecution is going on then they can do so but if the other party that is the taxpayer has filed any appeal okay then please wait till the time is appeal till, till the time the appeal is disposed of or if the other person has not filed the appeal then at least wait till the time the person has the option to go and file the appeal okay only after that only after that uh, his publication the pub, his publication means his information can be made public his information means uh, let's say if it is an individual then that individual's name that uh, you know against this particular individual prosecution is going on under gst etc will be made public okay similarly if it is a firm then details of the firm name of the partners etc can also be made public here but please wait till the appeal gets disposed of or till the time limit for filing the appeal expires yes okay then going on to the next one that is section number 161 which talks about rectification again an uh, important section section number 161 which talks about rectification of error apparent on the face of the record now let's say if there is any gst authority which has passed okay which has passed any decision which has passed any order which has given issued any notice or any certificate or any document applicable to five five things okay if it has made any of these things and if in this particular document order decision notice etc if there is any mistake which is apparent on record okay means you know dikkar ara you can see it very easily that this is a mistake this is not change of opinion okay if there is a mistake which is apparent from record then in that case authority can sue or to rectify it or it can do the rectification if any gst officer has told this authority that there is a mistake in your document or if the affected person brings it to the notice of this authority within three months from the date of such issue, then in such case rectification of that particular document, notice, order, etc. can be done. But no rectification can be done after six months from the date of issue of such documents. Means if rectification has to be done, it has to be done within a time period of six months from the date of issue of any of these things. Are you clear with this okay and suppose if there is any arithmetical error or if there is any clerical error or if there is any correction only spelling mistake kind of a thing then the time limit of six months is not applicable and if because of this rectification someone is getting aggrieved then first give reasonable opportunity of being heard and then only go for rectification are you clear with this okay then section number 164 165 gives the powers to the government to make rules and regulations uh, actually all the rules under gst are made by the government okay and all the regulations all the regulations are made by the cbic okay cbic makes the regulations a uh, government makes the rules right and whenever any new rule regulation notification etc is issued then first get it approved in the parliament that is laid down before both the houses of parliament at least for a period of 30 days okay and if approved then only after that that rule regulation etc will be deemed to have been passed then going on to the next section that is uh, section number 168 which talks about powers of cbic that is the board to issue circulars instructions directions to the cgst officers okay now board is the topmost authority there under indirect tax cbic okay so cbic can issue some circulars instructions uh, orders etc to the cgst officers so that cgst officers can implement the provisions of cgst law in an uniform manner so that everyone follows the same treatment only for that it is receiving circulars instructions etc now these circulars are binding only on the cgst officers okay these are not binding on the assessee these are not binding on the taxpayer okay these are only for the department and suppose if there is any uh, you know difference between the circular and between the law then always the law is going to prevail yes then section number 168a again important section 168a says that under gst we have studied so many time periods so many timelines etc can these time limits be extended so the answer is yes these can be extended if it is due to the reasons of force measure that is 
वॉर लाइक सिचुएशन अर्थ क्वेक फ्लड साइक्लॉन पैंडमिक एपिडेमिक ओके इफ एनी ऑफ सच काइंड ऑफ थिंग्स हैव हैपन विच इज बियॉन्ड द कंट्रोल ऑफ लाइक विच इज विच इज एनी सच एक्टिविटी विच इज बीन कॉज ड्यू टू नेचर ओके देन इन सच अ केस गवर्नमेंट हैज द पावर टू एक्सटेंड द टाइम लिट्स yes then going on to the next section again important that is section number 169 which talks about service of notice okay now when we talk about any notice order decision summons communications etc if these are to be served on the assessee okay how can the department serve these on the assessee so either it can be given directly okay hand delivery etc can be done or courier can be done to that particular addressee that is to the taxpayer or to his manager or to his authorized representative or to his advocate or to his authorized representative or to any person who is regularly employed with him in the business or to any adult member of the family residing with the taxable person this is one basic way of giving the service of any notice or it can be given by way of registered post speed post courier etc or it can be sent by way of email on the email address that was given at the time of registration or it can be published in the local newspaper of that particular taxpayer's area of business or area of residence or it can be put on the common portal in his dashboard that notice etc will be visible and if not uh, and or alternatively it can be affixed at that taxpayer's place of business on a at a conspicuous place it can be uh, placed affixed on at his place of business or the place of residence and if none of these methods work then in that case cgst officer in his office there will be a notice board that notice will be put that notice order summon etc will be put on that particular notice board okay when you are sending it by registered post courier etc then it will be deemed that it has been served to that person within those many number of days within which normally within which normally uh the courier post etc gets delivered okay example example if normally a speed post takes 4 days for delivery then it will be assumed that after 4 days the notice has been already served on that person okay if suppose we are publishing it in the newspaper or suppose if we are tendering it to the other person uh, okay or if we are affixing it on his uh, at his place of business etc then on the day when this activity is done it is deemed that the notice has been served on the other person yes okay then the next provision just for your knowledge next provision is talking about rounding off of tax okay this is not about rounding off of amount in the invoices in the invoices you can keep the decimals there is no problem but when you are making the payment of tax to the government at that time they say that please follow this rounding off principle let's say your amount of tax is equal to 120.10 okay then it has to be rounded off to the nearest number that is 120 year okay suppose if it is 120.50 okay or if it is 120.80 for example then it has to be rounded off to 121 so 50 paisa or above higher side and uh, if it is less than 50 paisa then to the lower side are you clear till here yes and then next section that is section number 171 which talks about the anti profiteering measure okay now what happens in this anti profiteering measure we already know that under indirect taxes the burden is borne by the consumer right the burden of taxes go to the it ultimately falls on the consumer so now they are telling that let's say for example suppose if there is a reduction in rate of tax okay government has done a reduction in rate of tax on any goods or on supply of any goods or services okay and whenever you are taking whenever you are taking any benefit of input tax credit whenever you are taking any benefit of input tax credit then that burden should not be passed on to the consumer okay or uh, or let's say you are taking the refund from the government or any such thing so whenever you have got the benefit please don't collect it additionally from the consumer okay example example let's say earlier the rate of tax was 28% now the government has reduced it to 18% you don't collect 28% from the consumer okay collect 18% only please pass on that benefit to the consumer also this is what they are telling okay so uh, and because of that can we say there will be ultimately reduction in the rate of Uh, there will be ultimately reduction in the rate of prices of those goods right so if there is a commensurate reduction in prices well and good okay because of these reasons means means you are passing on the benefit to the consumer okay but can there be such tax some taxpayers who are not passing on these benefit to the consumer 
okay so for that purpose there will be an authority called as anti profiteering authority okay anti profiteering authority who will interfere in between and who will make sure that this anti profiteering measure is implemented on that particular taxpayer okay who is this anti profiteering authority now now that earlier it was napa national anti profiteering authority now uh, uh, competition commission of india okay competition commission of india is notified as the anti profiteering authority now what is the work of this anti profiteering authority it will check whether there is any rate reduction whether that uh, because of that rate reduction is there any commensurate reduction in prices or not okay then it will identify those taxpayers who have not passed on the benefit to the consumers okay if it has found that okay there are some taxpayers who have not found not passed on this benefit then it will order that person to do the reduction in prices and then it will tell that please pass on this benefit okay or pay back this benefit back to the recipient along with interest at the rate of 18% from the day when you had collected this extra amount till the date when you are returning it back please give this money back to the recipient suppose if that recipient or that consumer is not identifiable or not traceable as of now then please deposit the same in the consumer welfare fund okay to give you some more detail 50% to the state consumer welfare fund and 50% to the center consumer welfare fund state with state consumer welfare fund wherever this particular order has been passed okay so if the recipient is traceable please give the benefit to that please pay back that benefit to that recipient along with interest if that recipient is not uh, traceable then that benefit along with interest Give, deposit it in the consumer welfare fund then because he has done this uh, profiting thing then penalty will be imposed penalty can be imposed by this authority and it can even lead to cancellation of registration and this authority is required to submit a performance report to the gst council on every quarterly basis by 10th of the next month that uh, who all were found guilty what all punishments we have imposed on such persons how much money has been deposited uh, in the consumer welfare fund how much amount has been refunded back to the recipients all these things all these things are the functions of the um, anti profiting authority are you clear with this okay so in this case even the consumer in in this case even the consumer can go to the consumer can go to the uh, to some authority saying that sir uh, there was a reduction in tax but we have not got that benefit okay so consumer goes to the state screening committee who will check whether it is a case of profiting state screening committee will further give the case to the standing committee who will also check whether the claim of state screening committee is correct or not then the matter goes to the director general of anti profiting which will do the investigation of this profiting and then the matter comes before the anti profiting authority and the final order will be passed by the anti profiting authority who will determine how much is the amount of profiting how much should be given back to the recipient how much is the interest on that and what penalty is to be levied on such a person okay penalty amount is how much it is 10% of such profited amount if the profited amount is not deposited within 30 days of the date of passing the order mm-hmm. means when the anti profiting authority is passing the order within 30 days if you either refund it back to the recipient or if you deposit in the consumer welfare fund well and good if not done then the penalty becomes applicable is equal to 10% of the profited amount yes okay then after that going on to the next one uh anything else that we need to do here is okay so under section 3 4 5 6 they have spoken about the officers okay cgst officers sgst officers utgst officers under section number 3 they have even given you the name of the officers okay we have seen this name somewhere or the other commissioner is there assistant commissioner is there deputy commissioner is there joint commissioner is there additional commissioner is there only commissioner is there commissioner of appeals is there principal commissioner is there principal chief commissioner etc these are are the officers who are appointed under your cgst law for the purpose of discharge of functions under this particular law okay uh, in addition to those officers which we have just seen cbic has the powers to appoint more number of officers at the superintendent levels okay they will be given their powers their powers will be mentioned under the cgst law and um, the officers officers who are appointed under sgst utgst even they can be appointed even they can act as the cgst officers if so 
notified yes and the last point here is in the case of insolvency okay in the case of ibc now if let's say there is a particular company which has gone for insolvency under ibc so that company is called as what that corporate person is called as the corporate debtor okay i always used to say under law corporate debtor is nothing but the defaulter person who has now come under ibc because that person has been declared as insolvent so now if that person has come under ibc his cirp is going to start corporate insolvency resolution process that is his revival process is going to start as soon as his revival process go is going to start there is a person called as irp and rp who is appointed interim resolution professional and resolution professional these persons are appointed who are going to do the cirp okay so whenever whenever ibc starts against any defaulting company then this corporate debtor is required to take this corporate debtor is required to take a new registration under gst within 30 days of appointment within 30 days of appointment of this irp or rp within 30 days it will have to apply for new gst registration in every state wherever that corporate debtor was earlier registered okay because even during insolvency even during your crp your business is still running okay so now all the returns etc that you have to file that will be as per the new gst registration but but new gst registration is not required if corporate debtor had earlier means before insolvency it had never defaulted in filing the gst returns it had never defaulted in filing its gstr1 means if there was no gst default then now during its insolvency it is not required to take any new gst registration are you clear with this okay this was a special point which was applicable only for the purpose of ibc yes i hope you are very very clear till here everyone i have just taken up all the important sections okay i have not covered all i have taken all the important sections from this particular chapter and this much should be sufficient yes thank you so much enjoy